like I said every morning, how appreciative I am to have been able to be here. I regret not being here tonight to hear Pastor Kevin bring the word. I will be headed back to Inglewood trying to get ready to roll for Sunday, but it has just been such an honor, a treat to be here, to get to meet you, and uh, what a wonderful group of people you are. What a great church this is. What a blessed church this is. I've walked this property, I, you know, staying at the retreat, I've got up early. Some people don't get up early, apparently, but I got up early, and... Uh, I just, you know, just walking that property and just thanking God for the vision, for the work, for the everything that's been put in that over the years. I don't know the complete timeline of all that, but I know this. It took time. It took people laboring. And, and I just want to commend you, church, for, for what you have accomplished. But as we get into Ruth 4, saying all that is... There is a heritage of God's people, and there's a heritage for the Sadat and the Church of God. There's a future. So we've been trying to lay the groundwork here about Ruth and all that she's gone through, and if you're here for the first time, uh, I think that you can catch up on the... I think Pastor Kevin said he had to go back to day one to figure out where in the world I came from. So, uh, no, uh, but... Uh, I just, uh, you look at this, Ruth, and, and I didn't even say this. Ruth's a four-chapter book in the Old Testament that barely mentions the name of God and is written, the name of the book is for a non-Jewish woman. It is the only one in the Bible that meets those criteria. It is an anomaly of the Scripture. But because of that, I think what it does for us today in 2021, it is the greatest example of the grace of God in our lives. Because if Ruth herself, the Moabitess, the outcast herself, gets recorded in the annals of history and gets to be part of a legacy, because we're going to see this little line that God is, you know, this whole thing's providential and the whole thing is the orchestration of God, where we see what happens in Ruth's life. Again, I want us to understand what God wants to do in our life. So let's jump in. You can go to chapter 4. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I just thank you, Lord. I do thank you for this atmosphere of praise and worship. You have promised us we're two or three gather in your name. You're in the midst of them, God. I thank you for your presence. And Lord, as we delve into your word one more time, I do ask you to anoint me this morning to say what you'd have me to say. But I pray you open up our hearts and ears that we hear what you have. Let your word go forth and let it cut us, God. Divide us in our hearts and minds, God, that we will lean closer to you. Let today be a day, God, that we just hear you speak to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So yesterday we, we get to where we begin to see Naomi, whose name means pleasant one, who changed her name to bitter one, starts seeing the handiwork of God, comes up with the plan, has... Uh, Ruth slip out in the midnight hour, lay at the feet of, of Boaz to present herself available to him in marriage. The proposition is made. Uh, it's an odd thing. She pretty well proposes to him. Let's throw another thing that's out, way out in left field in this thing. He does what he needs to to make sure there's no other people in the family line, which there was one, but he refused. So now we get to this, the fourth chapter. And it and you know, it begins, I will love you. What I want to take out is the grace of God, the power of God, the reach of God. He loves us regardless of what we face. Here we see the foundation of relationships. We live in a throwaway world. Love is something that seems very fleeting. We love for a moment, then we don't, and it's over, whatever. That's not love. I see... In chapter 4, the far-reaching grace, power, and love of God for us. I see to the extent that God loves us, the reach that God will love us. 
the places that the love of God will go where no others will go. And when I'm talking about the love of God, I do want to really talk more maybe about the grace of God. Let me establish, God loves us. The Bible says when we were yet sinners, he died for us. Anybody know, anybody heard of John 3, 16? It's kind of a, it's pretty good. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. Romans says, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. We'll hide death, principalities, spirits of darkness. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's very established. God loved us. He, God loved us when we were sinners. God loved us before we knew him. God loved us from the beginning of time. There is no doubt that God loves us. So what happens, though, is how do we respond to the love of God? That's the difference, because God's always loved you. I love my child. There's times I don't like my child. <laughs> Maddie, turn it off this morning, Maddie. Uh, there's times I have to discipline my child. There's times there's chastisement. There's times there's these things. Sometimes I think we mistakenly linked together, oh, God loves me, everything's okay. No, God loves me. I love my child, but child, you better, you better get her, you better get your ducks in a row because the love of the Father's about to come down on you. <laughs> uh, so we see this, th this beauty of the love of God, but more than that, we see the people that are submitting to the love of God, putting themselves into the love of God. So as I'm talking about this, I'm talking really about the far-reaching power, not only the love of God, but the grace in the relationship with God. He loves us, but if we don't love Him, that's not a relationship. Amen? I love, when I was in high school, I loved some, I loved some people. They didn't love me back, though. That's the most beautiful girl in the world. I love you. Who are you? You know what I mean? So, uh, leave me alone, stalker. Uh, those kind of things. It takes. Well, we, we didn't have Facebook back then. So, uh, so I, I just say this. So, as I talk about love and the love of God, and as we walk through these points, as I see in Ruth chapter 4, I think it falls upon us. Balls in your court. The love of God is around us. He has loved you. He has sent his only son for you. He's given us everything we need. So it really falls on us. How are we going to respond to that powerful, beautiful love that God has for us? And I want you to know that the love of God, the grace of God, can reach us regardless of the past we've lived. Ruth was a foreigner. She was an outcast. She was not accepted in her culture. She served a strange God in a strange land in strange ways. And despite her moral demonstration, she was a good person. She had a past. I've talked, I've shared a few stories. Powerful, I mean, heroin addicts getting saved, the meth addicts getting saved. When we were hiking yesterday, and I, I love the trip, and it's, Randy's good and I shared this with Randy. My dad, I'm biased, but my dad is the most awesome man that I've ever known. But he was not a Christian until I was in my late teens because my dad, and I'm, this is just the truth, he lived a moral life that he, when he looked at people that said they were Christians, he lived such a moral life, he's such an upstanding, good man it was hard for him to understand why he needed salvation in his life. So, yeah, I talk about these great stories of, I mean, people coming in, you know, you got, they got scarlet letter on their forehead almost, you know, hey, man, we, but we were having a revival, and I, I've talked about the, 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 the structure, the makeup of the town we lived in, but when I was a, I was a teenager, I, I was, I think, maybe a senior in high school, uh, TVA, Tennessee Valley Authorities, is a huge company. It's where we get all our electricity. It's the whole uh, river system, dams, hydroelectric, and all that. A man that worked there in our church had a buddy, uh, Brother Boyd, is, all, uh, is what I remember. He was an African-American man. He was a man of God. They worked together. He came and held us a revival, and we had revival. 
that man preach, but one night he preached, he was sweating, he was presenting the word of God. And again, let me go, let me go back to that day, to have that man in our church in 1980-whatever in Inglewood. We were, we were the black sheep of the community, but I remember a service. I don't even think we had anointing cloth, so what he did, he, he took his tie off and began to cut pieces of his tie and said, and prayed over it and sent it out. My mom got one, put my dad's pillow. And we prayed, and I was fasting for I just knew my dad's going to come in. And he's going to come to the altar. And he's going to get saved. But we've been praying for a while, and we'll get up Sunday morning to get ready to go to church. Me and my mom, my older brother, my little brother. And dad's up and dressed. I thought, wow. You know, we're going to church. We're going to church. That Tuesday, in our barn, on our little farm, he knelt down in the middle aisle of our three-row three barn, accepted Jesus Christ as he sick. I thought, well, I didn't see it that way. I had, I mean, he was going to come to church and the, the angels were going to sing and the place was going to go wild. And, but he needed grace and he needed forgiveness and he needed repentance as much as anybody I've shared a story about because he was on his way to hell. And I'm telling you, God loved him, but I'm glad my dad knelt down one day and said, I love you back. My dad does not miss a service. They live in my hometown. They are in my church every Sunday when, when they are physically able to come. But not only was he the best man ever now, now he's the best man that loves Jesus. Amen. Being moral is not enough. Ruth demonstrated morality but it wasn't until she said, your God is my God. And I will go with you and I will serve you. And when she dedicated her life to God, all of a sudden, more was able to come into her life. Amen. So regardless of the past we live, God can save us and he does love us and he has a future for us. But let me say this. Once God brings us out of our past, we don't have to go there anymore. Amen. Once he brings us out of that, amen, he brings us into a new land. She don't live in Moab anymore. She's living in the house of bread. Amen. She's not living the life. She's not an outcast anymore. She's been brought into the family of God. Yes, we've all been brought out of sin, but praise be to God. That's not who I am. I'm not defined by my past. I'm not defined by who I was. I don't have to live that every day because when God set me free in whom the sun sets free, you are free indeed. Hallelujah. I, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to teach. They told me I was teaching. I, I, I just didn't understand the words you were saying there. God's grace is there for us regardless of where we have come from. And church, never forget, there are some that come from the gutter I talk about. There are some like my dad that still needs Jesus. Everybody needs to come to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Be my whoever walks through your doors, they need Jesus Christ. Oh, that's the best guy I know. He needs Jesus. That's the worst sinner I've ever seen. They need Jesus. Amen. We, we don't rank it. God loves them all. Ruth was a lady that represents, though, whatever was in her past, God brought her out of that. God's grace was enough. He loved her, and she began to love him. And his love is there for us, regardless of the people we meet. Somebody wrote this down. Said there's, people tend to fall into four categories in our, our life. Those, those people that ignore us, there's people that hurt us, those that hinder us, and those that help us. As a result of someone else's actions, it affects us sometimes. But when we accept the grace and the power and the love of God in our lives, and we find out who we are in Jesus Christ, we cannot let other people's actions determine our relationship with Jesus Christ. No doubt, no doubt Ruth was treated poorly. Ruth was probably spoken poorly about. Like I said, in my speculation, how many fields did she go to? But people said, you, you're not welcome here. You go glean somewhere else. Boaz had a field where he said, come on. So dot be a church where you say, come on. Yeah, but people, people's mistreated me, not here. Because here you're going to find that fourth group 
a group of people that is there to help us. And we can't let others' actions determine our future in Jesus Christ. There's the grace of God and the love of God regardless of the problems we face. Once again, I wish I could be the rainbow preacher or the unicorn preacher and the, the yellow brick road preacher, and it's just all. Oh, we go through problems because of the sinful nature of Adam and Eve that's been going through there. We live in a central, uh, sinful world. The more and more I look out my window, I'm not waking up in Jerusalem, I'm waking up in Babylon. But that's not going to stop me from worshiping God. God's pouring out His Spirit, amen. But when our relationships with people, sometimes we face, there's so many problems we face in our relationship. Uh, sometimes there's communication problems. People can be misunderstood. Be careful. There can be expectation problems. Sometimes we disappoint each other. Don't let that stop you understanding that God loves you. We face financial problems. I'm sorry, I face financial problems. I, I know you people never have in your whole life. It's all good. You may struggle. God still loves you. Don't let your circumstances determine your relationship with God. We are going to walk through struggles and problems. Ruth has came a long way. She's went from desolation. She's went from leaving her family. She's went from forsaking her religion. And she has stepped into this new place and this new world where she's been mistreated and she doesn't belong. But she didn't let any of that hinder her coming to a closer walk and finding her kinsman redeemer. We do face problems. My wife and I got to the point we didn't, we just thought we weren't going to be able to have kids. We'd been married for, for a while. We'd been married a little later in life and had been married for several years and we had this, you know, this perfect plan that we'd be married a few years and then we'd just start having perfect great kids and, and it just didn't roll out that way. And then we finally had our little girl at Maddie Garden, and my wife had a really struggling uh, pregnancy delivery. It was touch and go, and a lot of prayer and supplication went up, but we, we had Maddie, and she was, she turned out okay, you know, and, uh, yeah, she's all right. And uh, so, uh, and she was growing up, and she was about 18 months old. My wife was a nurse, and she went back to work, and she worked second shift, so evening times was me and Maddie time. I began to know with my wife again that something was going on with my child. She really couldn't, she wasn't speaking a whole lot then, a little bit, but she began to cry all the time. She'd want you to pick her up. When you picked her up, she would scream like you were killing her until you put her back down. She was uh, just going through all sorts of, of behavior. One day I couldn't find her in the house, couldn't find her anywhere. I'm going through the house. I'm in daddy panic mode. I get in her little bedroom. I think I kind of hear, I open her closet, and she is sitting in the corner of her closet in perfect darkness, just weeping. We've been taking her to the doctor. They couldn't find anything. She's running a fever constantly. They're doing all these tests, and we had a brand-new pediatrician, Young, and, and she finally called us back. She said, I, I, I called my mentors, and I think the mentor was in Washington State, and she said, it sounds like she has most but not all of the symptoms of Kawasaki disease, which is a blood infection. It's named for the doctor that found it in Japan. His last name was Kawasaki, not the motorcycle. So so it said, you need to go to Children's Hospital now. So we said, okay, you know. So we get we, we drive up to Knoxville, Tennessee. We go to Children's Hospital. We walk in the doors. They remove Maddie. Boom, she's gone, you know, back to the back. I said, I need to move the car. So I went down and got moved the car and came back up and found my wife and says, where Maddie? She said, she's right there. I don't know. I said, my daughter didn't say a few words. She said, one. She said, daddy. And I could hear her screaming to the top of her lungs. Daddy, daddy, daddy. But I could not get to her. And they're doing tests and they're wiring her up and they... They're going to put some sort of uh, antibiotic, $13,000 antibiotic in her body to help her out. I'm struggling. I've been pastoring a few years. Things are going good. I feel like, you know, I'm going and I, I'm the man and, you know, and all these whatever. And So I go down, downstairs, go down the steps. 
and I don't really know where I'm going. I finally find a door. I think I'm on the ground floor, and I open the door, and I'm literally behind Children's Hospital around some dumpsters. And I look up into the heavens, and I'm going to pray this powerful prayer. The only words that come out of my mouth was my daddy. But there was not one door that could stop my heavenly father from coming and ministering to me. And I've never been closer to God than I was standing in that back alley, fellowshipping, crawling in my father's lap, crying, Abba, Father. Amen. And in my shortness that I couldn't get to my girl, my heavenly father could get to me, and I knew he could get to her. Amen. So we went up there, and for 24 hours we laid with her, and they said she has a, a, like a one in five chance of having heart disease the rest of her life. I stand here today to say I serve a God, though even though we go through struggles, there is nothing that can prevent him from walking with you in the struggle. Though we face hard times, we get some bad prognosis and diagnosis in our life, and sometimes we don't have everything figured out. I will let you know right now, our God's love and grace is enough to walk with us through those moments. And I learned in a back alley on Cumberland Avenue in Knoxville, Tennessee, that nothing could stop my father from walking with me through the valley, amen, and I want somebody in this place to know it doesn't matter where you've come from. God is with you. You may be saying, I'm facing hell on earth. That's okay. We serve the one that will walk with us, amen. I'm walking through the fire. That's okay. Take a look around. You are not alone, amen. Hallelujah. Let me tell somebody in here, Ruth is experiencing the power of the grace of God in her life, and she's walking out of Moab, and she's got a heritage and a future line before her. And even though we struggle, God is with us. Amen. We face moral problems sometimes. I think I've used the scripture, we stumble, we fall. When we sin, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father who's faithful and just to forgive us. I've learned in my years of pastoring, People stumble and fall. How do, you, how do you respond to that? I'm not as concerned with how they fail. I'm concerned whether they get back up again. Ruth has stumbled. She has failed. She has crawled out of the hole. She's come out of the foreign land. And here she is. We face health problems. And I just shared. All of you have got a story. One Sunday, I get in the pulpit, and I got a brand-new man sitting on the very front row. I didn't know his name, and I don't know about your church. We have a real bad way. If we don't know somebody, somebody will identify them. So this was Colonel Sanders. He come in, he had the gray hair, he had the long, the long goatee, so I don't know who that is. I said, who is Colonel Sanders today? And I said, oh, yeah, I knew exactly who they was talking about. It was the guy on the front row. <laughs> his name was Keith. Keith is new to our church. He came in. Keith wound up being one of the most unbelievable, uplifting men in our church. And, and we're going along. I get a call once, but his liver's shutting down. He's got multiple physical things going on from his past. And then he's not there for a few weeks, and I call him, and he, things are bad. So we begin to pray, and we begin to seek God. And then one Sunday, Keith comes in, but he's got his, he's got his oxygen. He's rolling. Today, I've had to call in. I can't work. He oversaw the construction of oil rigs and uh, major factories and these things. And he just said, you know, I can't do it. So he's toting that. And then one day he called, you know, he said, I'm feeling a little better. Oh, we're praying for your healing, man. We're praying for your healing. He kept coming in, pulling his oxygen. And then the Sunday came. Here he comes to the back door. No oxygen. He's praising God. He's worshiping God. He, he's just that way. And he calls me and says, I won't be at church for a while. I'm going back to work. He goes back to work. That man was healed, changed, and delivered. We face health issues, but we also serve a God whose name is Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. So I know that he loves me. Then somebody says, well, sometimes God doesn't heal. I, when I pray for somebody, I pray with the expectation and the possibility knowing that God is able to do all things. 
So let me say this, because here's what I, I struggle with in my own church sometimes. When believers pass away, it is not defeat. Amen. It is promotion. It is victory. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. Amen. I've seen people falling apart. Why did Grandma die? Because she's going. Because it's time for her to go to heaven. Rejoice. Scripture says, "Weep with those that weep." I've wept at many a funeral, but I've rejoiced at the same time because I know they're better off than I am. So yes, health issues will come, but those that are in Christ Jesus, we will be healed instantly. We'll be healed gradually. He said, "What do you mean?" Well, Jesus healed a guy once. Said, "Can you see?" And he said, "Well, kinda. I see better than I did, but I still see." So then he done it again then he could see I think sometimes there's gradual healing in our life or we will be healed ultimately if we, if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord with all that we have there's healing for all of us so I claim healing whether it, I see it instantly or not if you're a believer you will be healed no more sickness no more sorrow no more tears no more worry no more fret no more hallelujah I'm re amen, ready to go to that place even so Am I read the whole book of Revelation? It, 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 you know, it, it is wild. It is bizarre. It is overwhelming. It's hard to understand. The only thing I really understand is the last few words. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. I, I lean that way. Look at what's going on in the news. Come on, Jesus. Oh, what are we going to do? Come on, Jesus. I've lost loved ones and friends. Come on, Jesus. It's time. Because of the love of God, because of the grace of God, we have to determine that we will walk with God and be an example of faith. We see the devotion of Boaz to this lady. We see the devotion of Boaz to bring her in, to redeem her, to give her a future, to secure their future. In the text of chapter 4, you'll notice that, that those who bless Boaz focused on God. He did have a reputation for deep and evident faith. He was the kind of man that could say to his wife and children, you can repeat anything I say. You can do anything I do. You can go anywhere I go. And you can see anything I can see. Let us lead. The Apostle Paul in the Scripture says, follow me as I follow Christ. That is a powerful Scripture. We need to get to the point in our relationship with Jesus Christ and our walk with God that we can tell others, come on, you can follow me. Because I say this a lot. Well, don't look at me. Don't follow me. I'm, I'm a mess. I'm a wreck. I, I understand there's, there's different things, but I know this. I believe in the transforming power of the grace of God that once I receive his grace and his love, that he can change us and he can help us. And there is a purpose in your life to do more, to live more, and to have more in your walk with Jesus Christ. And when we get to the point that we can lead others to Jesus and we can lead others to the, the cross, we can lead others to our heavenly home, that's what God wants us to do. And that's what I see in the power and the, the example of Boaz. I'm a man of God. I brought this woman in my life. And now I, I, you, you can follow me. You can look at me. We, we lift musicians. We lift uh, athletes up on such pedestals. And many times they're like, hey, don't look up to me. And that's kind of creeped in the church. Don't look up to me. If, if somebody can't look up to those that profess Jesus Christ, who can we look up to? If we can't look and say, I want to be like them. When I dedicate children at our church, I don't know when we started doing it. But I asked, the, I asked the parents, will you, will you raise this child to the best of your ability and grow them up? Then I look at our church, and, I, and I, I make our church, will you show this child what it is to love Jesus Christ? Men, will you be the example of manliness and, and what a man really is and a man that loves God? Will you show this child? Because I tell you what, is the one element that's missing in all of our cultures is the lack of fathers. And Boaz represents 80% of men in prison today don't ha didn't have a father in their life. Yeah. Some people don't have a father, and I'm not here to say, oh, I'm saying there are spiritual mothers and fathers sitting in this congregation that can be an example to people outside of, of your little circle that they need you. They need you to help them along the way. They need you to live right and live a, a life that they can, let's say, I want to be like that person. I had those men in my life. I was sharing one man in our church. His name's Eddie Baxter. He teaches for me. He preaches for me sometimes. He's illiterate. 
except the only thing he is able to read is the Bible. He prayed with me when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and he prayed for me when a service ended one night and I was lingering in the altars and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He was there with me. When people in our church come up for prayer, I say, Eddie, you come pray with because he's such a man of faith and such power. He's not learned. Like I said, he really can't read. But when he opens the scripture, he knows what it says. And that man was my example. I've went to school. I've got a bachelor's degree. I've got a master's degree. I, I pursued education. But that man was my example of what a man of God should do and live like. This church is full of people, women and men and, and young people that can show others what it means. Boaz said, look to me. You can follow me. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through uh, 9, to me, what Boaz represented, and, and you can find it in those scriptures, he confessed God boldly. We need to do that. He taught his faith regularly. We need to do that. He lived his faith, faith openly. We need to do that. And he passed on that which he lived to others. That's what we need to do. And if we can enjoy and experience the love of God, we know that he will edify and encourage you to become your God-given best. God used Boaz to lift up Ruth, to redeem her. He represents Jesus Christ to us. He's the kinsman redeemer. So what did he do? He took in a foreigner, he took in someone that labored as the lowest servant. He took in someone that was treated as a household maid servant. And he took somebody and made her his wife. We are the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. And then lastly, when we experience the grace, the power, and the love of God, we know that he will restore you when we stumble or when we fall or when we sin. If you want to look later at the 14th or the 17th verses, here we see the transformation of Naomi. Naomi went from bitter, now she's joyful. She went from having nothing, now to having everything. To a point of desolation, to now to be prosperous and wealthy. Naomi went from being a woman that, that had it all, lost it all, now she's got it all back and more. Although she stumbled, Ruth helped Naomi in her faith. This book is full of such connected relationships that relied upon each other, Naomi and Ruth. The relationship, the kins of Naomi and Boaz. The love affair and relationship marriage of Ruth and Boaz. It's just full of all these wonderful relationship connections. That's what church is. That's what church is. Know this. When we stumble, when we fall, what will we do to people? Where will our heart be? I think a church that loves people, a church that has experienced the grace and power that Ruth did, a church like this will dot in a church of God. It is your responsibility. You're going to hold people accountable. If you see your brother in a fall, go to them. Oh, I won't do that. They'll get mad at me. I would rather make somebody mad through the act of love and grace to say, brother, we're concerned about you. I had to do it. The Bible lays out how we should do that. But it comes down, oh, but, and I hear this all the time. Oh, the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. Uh, kind of. That's saying don't judge somebody in a way that you don't want to be judged. It doesn't say you can't judge people. And judge is a hard word, but you know what? We as Christians, we need to have accountability to those that other that profess Christ. And thank God for people in my life that says, thank, let me even go this way. Thank God for the Holy Spirit that lives with me. Where if I, some thoughts get in my head or some things start, I get this little red flag going ding, 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 ding. Right. Right. I don't know if anybody has other's vehicles look like mine, but I've got this awesome dash, and it's just like a Christmas tree. <laughs> Service engine soon, brakes here. I don't even know what traction control is, but apparently I love. That's the Holy Spirit in my life. 
Give me the signals. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And church, through love, compassion, let's hold people accountable. Let's forgive them. Come on back home. We love you. We will guard your name. We'll lift you up. And we will restore you. And on this, made it through the pandemic, went through all that we went through. Coming to the end of the year, my youth pastor comes in my office and said, I don't know what, what, what's on your mind, but here's what the Lord's laid on my heart. He just keeps speaking, restore to me. Tears come to my eyes. I thought, that, that's what it is. So January 1-1 hits. We've, we've proclaimed the year of 2021 as a year of restoration that everything that was trying to be took away from us and everything we thought we lost, God would bring it back. And we've been preaching restore, restore. That's what led me deep into the, the depths of Ruth. It is the story of restoration. And I know this, again, looking at the, the handiwork, the hard work, the prayers, everything in this church, hear the, hear the voice of the Lord. I will restore you. I will bring to fruition all that you have sought and prayed for. I will bring the harvest in. I've set you as a beacon on a hillside. And I will draw people in. God has placed you at, in this church at this moment, at this time, because there's a lot of roofs out there wandering in Moab, coming back home, and I feel the Spirit of the Lord is just telling you to, to hold faithful, look unto me, and know that I'm your God, and that I will restore, I will renew, and I will bless you. That's what I came to say today. Look at, the, look at Ruth. Look where God has brought us. Look where God has taken you. Look at all the goodness of God in your life and get excited because when we get to verse 14 and 15, it indicated that a newborn baby, not Boaz, was Naomi's redeemer. This is interesting because in generations to come, see, because we go from Boaz and then we get a guy named... Uh, Obed, and then we get a guy named Jesse, and then we get a guy named David. And then a few generations down, we get this guy named Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Naomi, I'm bitter, and I'm in a foreign land, and I've lost everything. No, no, I'm the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. Yeah. How in the world does Ruth and Naomi and these people get in the lineage of Christ? Where does Rahab come from in the lineage of Christ? Where does the woman that doesn't even have a name, Uzziah's wife, we know who she is, but she's in there too. Who am I? In the hand of God, you are a powerful, you are a son, a daughter of the living God. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are a chosen generation, a royal priest. Who am I? You are God's chosen one, and you're the voice of God in the wilderness. Who are you? You're, you're someone that can make a change. Who is Naomi? She's in the lineage of Jesus. Who is Ruth? She was an outcast Moabite. She's in the lineage of Jesus. Who are we? We are God's children, and it's time we started acting living and expecting God to bless his children because the inheritance that they receive is still flowing down right now. Are these people drunk? We are not drunk. It's too early in the morning. But this is the prophecy of Joel. It is for, he said it is for you and your children and your children's children and to generations away far away. I don't know if I can get any farther than Soldotna, Alaska, but I know this, the Holy Spirit is still pouring down. The grace of God is still as real as ever. The forgiveness and the love of God is still more powerful and it is here for you at this moment at this time to do the work of God thank you Lord for letting us be Ruth and bringing us out of our darkness bringing us out of our poverty and letting us live in the house of bread thank you Lord Heavenly Father I thank you again I thank you for these people I thank you for their love and their passion for you I thank you Lord 
for what you're going to do in their midst, in this area. I give you glory and praise right now. I'll praise you on this side of the river, God, because I know you'll part it and let me cross over to the other side. But I won't wait that long, God. I'm going to praise you right now for your handiwork in this place. I'm going to thank you for the souls that are to be saved, the souls that are going to be healed, those that are going to be delivered. I thank you right now, God, for what they are going to see, God, for what they're going to go through, for, from the abundance of your grace and your mercy and your love and your power, God. I'm going to give you praise and glory right now. For my faith is not in what I see, but it is in what I know you're going to do, God. And I will see it, and they will see it. And I claim that, I speak that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Can we give God praise in this place? Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm done, but I'm not done. Come here a minute, Pastor Andy. I can't express how much I love this man right here. And I thank him for allowing me to come and bother you guys for a week. But when he called me and said, can you come? And I figured out I could come. And I told my church, I'm going to Alaska. I'm going to get to teach. I think they prayed for you very much. Said, oh, Lord. No, they, they, they got stirred. And I think they have a, a kinship to this place now. I know several have been watching back home. But they, they wanted us to sow into you. So if it's all right with you, I just asked them. I said, I said, they are blessing me. They are taking care of me. They got a place for me to stay. That's it. Oh, man. I said, I don't even know how much. I don't know if they got money in the bank or they don't. They said, it doesn't matter. We want to bless that church. We want to sow and do it. And maybe a little selfishly, they want to be part of every soul and every restoration and every deliverance. So they said, can we sow some seed in there? So I just want to present you with this chip and say how much we love you and what an honor it is to be here. It's not an overwhelming amount, but I pray that it is seed in this place and that it will bring forth fruit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Amen. Uh, well, it's not supposed to go that way. Well, I feel blessed for all of us. Um, we didn't, we had a plan <laughs> uh, for destiny, and that, that plan was really, I mean, really it was executed back in January um, before the Humphreys uh, made their announcement. We had a plan for speakers. We had everything lined out and worked out, and um, we did the best we could as humans to have a, a good plan, but sometimes God has different plans, amen? So, um, I do believe that there's a relationship that's been formed here. Obviously, Pastor Scott and I have a relationship. Um, I don't know if I've shared this with you or not, and I, I'll make this quick, but uh, I've told you that Pastor Scott was mine and best youth pastor. We've worked out the dates. I can't, we can't figure out if I was a junior or a senior in high school when he got there. It was in 93. Um, I graduated in uh, in, in May of 94, so I believe I was a senior when you got there. I, I believe that's right. That one year obviously made a difference in my life. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but one of the greatest impacts that he had on my, on my life at that time, and I, I've shared this with a couple of people, uh, in August of 94, right after I graduated high school, uh, my younger sister, she was 14 at the time, uh, was killed in an accident caught a car accident and our pastor at our church was <coughs> excuse me and we, we believe it was general assembly so many years ago we were talking about it the other day and um, Scott was a youth pastor and he got the call that this had happened from our pastor uh, which he already knew that, that the accident happened and um, had never done a funeral before uh, it was the first time he'd ever been asked to do a funeral And it was a big funeral. Um, it was a lot. 
Uh, and many of you know when a child dies, it's, it impacts a community. But the words that he spoke and the love that he put on my family. I'll never forget it. And um, he'll always be my brother. So you don't, you don't have an invitation to come back next year. You have uh, an expectant. You're, you're expected to. So uh, I'm afraid of what these people will do to me if I don't ask you to come back. So, um, yeah, so, but thank you for this. It was obviously unnecessary. I, I really, I mean, really unnecessary. Uh, we want to bless you, but, but uh, way more than this, you have blessed us with your word this week. I, I believe that you're, um, when God moved on you and you called me and said at the last minute that he, he changed, I'm not going to lie, I was sweating a little bit. I was like, oh, it's kind of late in the game to be changing what you're going to be speaking on, but I know now God was in it, and I, and I trust him now more than ever. But listen, if you appreciate Pastor Scott, please just let him know. Amen. Uh, we're going to cover him in prayer, and he's going to be leaving it uh, this afternoon from Kenai. Make that flight up to, uh, to Anchorage, praying for clear skies so he can see what he hasn't seen. Many of you have taken that flight, so you know how beautiful it is. And then safe travels back home. Pray that God will continue to move in his church with his church family and grow that church. Um, the, the recovery community that's part of his church, that that just continues to flourish. Um, really hope that we can just partner with them going forward in that, in that aspect. Uh, there are a lot of similarities in our ministry. And so I know that, that he can be a big, a big help with us here and help God direct us. Uh, we're entering into a new thing here, and it's, it's, it's all part of the heritage of this church. Um, we have had many conversations about uh, when he got out. It doesn't take somebody with a lot of ministry experience to walk around this church and walk around the campgrounds and see the heritage that the Humphreys have placed into this place and the work. And I know people came before them, but if you look at the dates on those pictures out there, there's a lot bigger gap between their dates than there are anybody else's. So um, I am very humbled to, to be here and be a pastor, the pastor of this church. I try to think about it sometimes and it doesn't even seem real but I'm humbled to be here and it's I've just fallen in love with you people it's awesome so it's just a, a, a blessing to be here I love you I can't wait to see what God's going to do Be blessed. Please come back tonight. Let's see what God's going to do. Amen. Pastor Kevin is going to speak. Yes. God be with you. Have a blessed day.